you for coming out tonight. Oh, it's very, very impressive. So, um, as we've just heard, everything I think can be summed up in how I see what I've done is through telling stories. I, I think if I had to describe what I was actually, politely, I would say that I was a storyteller. And I think, I think every single person in this room is a storyteller. We all tell each other stories. We always have told each other stories since we've sat around campfires, you know, eating mammoth legs. We've told each other stories about the earth, about ourselves, about what's important to us, about what we're frightened of, what we want. Stories are how we motivate each other. And wrapped up in stories is lots of depth, lots of intricacy, which is actually very difficult to explain bit by bit. But in a story, it all kind of makes sense. So we are, as far as I know, the only species that tells stories, as far as we know. But our storytelling is complicated and it's innate. <clears throat> there isn't a child, I don't think, that doesn't like to listen to stories. And what we tell our children as stories is what's important to us. So we don't go take our little kids to bed at night and tell them stories about um, the stocks and shares or how the banks are doing. What we do is we tell them stories about teddy bears and, and birds and dreams and magical worlds and wonderful, usually natural imagery. And so what children hear from us is, is a wealth of wonder about the world and what they grow up into is something that's probably less than that, when the con different concerns take over and that wonder starts to disappear. I remember somebody uh, listening to David Attenborough once and, and a journalist asked him, when did you first, um, when, when did you start to sort of get excited about the natural world and carry on your career? He said, well, can I turn that around? When did you lose your excitement? And I think that's a very good way of putting it. So, as we've heard all over the news, all over recently, it seems like at last the world is slowly beginning to wake up to climate change. And there we are, on well, a not very interesting graph, that probably unless you were quite interested in graphs at school, just looks like a lot of squiggles, is one hell of a crisis. Can we just take a minute just to look at that? So there we are, for a whole of recorded history and beyond, um, oh, the carbon dioxide level in the atmosphere has never gone above that line. And now, just in the last few years, few decades, look where we are now. And that really matters because we're putting a blanket, in effect, we're putting a blanket around the earth and we're making it too hot. And when you do that to the atmosphere, there are many, many knock-on effects from that, which we'll go into. But that graph basically tells it all. But it's very hard to fall in love with a graph, isn't it? I mean, not many people's hearts have been turned by a pie chart or a graph. But, um, but that's what we have to do, because to make sense of that, to make it mean something to each person in this room and beyond, we've got to... We've got to relate to it in a very personal way and in a way that's very motivated. And that's where stories come in. That's where stories come in. So the way that we make this live is by telling stories about what it means to us. And we've had a lot of stories. We live in an age of huge stories. I can't think of a time, I mean, well, I don't know, there are, every age has its big stories, but boy, do we have ours. And just look at those that we've just had recently. Stories to tell. Look at Australia, my goodness. Did anybody else just get pitched into the depths of despair about what was happening in Australia? The corals bleaching in the oceans. Huge storms, unprecedented amounts of rainfall three months rainfall in a day or whatever it is around the world. The flooding of Venice, um, unprecedented amounts of flooding in Venice, the accelerated melting of ice caps, and very, very hot weather around the world. Just some of the stories that the news is full of and that we can relate to. So that graph doesn't mean that much on an emotional level, but suddenly our emotion and our imagination 
starts to come alive when we see things like that. And that's what I mean by being storytellers. Because we need to get out there and we need to tell these stories. These are the big stories that hit the headlines. There's lots and lots of little stories that don't, and they need telling as well. So everybody in this room from now on needs to think of themselves as the Earth's storytellers. Just to give you a bit more background, these are the heat extremes um, that, we, that we've seen in Europe. So the average temp temperature anomaly um, this last June, it was so extreme, it was just off the scale really. Um, and when you see it in big red blobs on a map, it really starts to, we start to see that we're not that far away from the hotspots. <laughs> so if you want to bring it home, it's quite hard to relate sometimes to other countries, but if you want to bring it home, we're not that far away. We're not that far away. In fact, we're going to get very close quite quickly. So this is from DEFRA. All these figures and graphs are from DEFRA. So 2080 temperatures um, are all pretty much going to rise by 10 degrees. So we're going to experience um, temperatures, hot days, hot days of 38 degrees in Bristol. I mean, that is extraordinary, isn't it? Has anybody in been in 38 degrees? Yeah, well, uh, it's really unpleasant. <laughs> I was once in 40.1 in Australia, and I literally thought I was going to die, and because uh, I don't like heat <coughs> very much. But look, look at London, 40.7. So that's DEFRA. That's DEFRA. That's not a scaremongering. That's government predictions. Look at Scotland, 32 degrees in Scotland. And these are flood warnings that we're going to expect. So look at those areas where they expect to definitely have to put out numerous flood warnings. Flood alerts and no warnings. I think it's pretty obvious where we should all be heading to. <laughs> Do you think we could all fit in that bit up there? Um, I think we're going to have massive issues around our coast. We won't. People in this room probably won't see that. I won't. But those are the predictions over the next 50 to 100 years. And we know because the, the, the newspapers are telling us. They're telling us that it's going to be very serious. The government has huge plans as to what to do to protect the most important sites around the country. These aren't airy-fairy things. These are written plans sitting on people's desks that are being worked on. And I know that the government is going to, the government, the, the, the country has decided that what, at whatever cost will protect London, but many other places will not be able to be protected. So the money will pour into defences around London, but I'm not sure, I'm not sure Western Supermare will get the amount of money that London does. So it's a really serious situation. This isn't something that, that is just put out by scaremongers. This is real. And we have to get to grips with what it means through stories. So what's going to happen? We're going to see these increasing number of storms that are quite serious. And I think there's been quite a lot of that recently, hasn't there? Even the last few days we've had Storm Brendan, isn't it? I love all these names. There was a, what was there once? There was a storm, I don't know, was a storm Harold or something that somebody was complaining about. How come, you know, America gets storm sort of Hercules and we get storm Harold? <laughs> um, but the naming of storms, I think, is another technique that's been used to try to help us to relate. And I think that's a very deliberate choice on, on the half of the... Um, uh, of the, the, the National Weather Agency. It's trying to get us to make a relationship with our weather. It's quite hard to do that, but if we give them a name, it's much easier. We also have the coral bleaching. Has anybody been to a coral reef? Yeah. yeah. Uh, it, when it's not bleached, when it's 
real and vibrant and wonderful. And then when you see that, you just want to disintegrate into a heap of nothingness. Because the ocean absorbs a lot of the carbon dioxide, becomes acidic, and the corals die. And that coral bleaching used to be, uh, was always happened in warm periods, but it was quite rare. Now it's an almost a yearly occurrence. So the corals tell us a story. We can tell a story through the, the bleaching of the corals. And what about Bristol? I looked up some, some tell us about what's going to happen to Bristol. So the worst case scenario, projected temperature by 2100, um, is going to rise by, um, well, 4.5 degrees. So the average daily temperature in Bristol will be 7 or 8 degrees, and um, up, and in July it's going to be up 5 degrees. This is the worst case scenario. And when you think about global temperatures rising by a certain number of degrees, I think it's, again, it's quite hard, so let's try and put that into a story. If I tell you that the average global temperature difference between the depth of the last ice age, when we had two miles of ice over most of Europe, the depth of the last ice age, the average temperature of the Earth then, compared to now, was four degrees. So we're going to go up by more than that, by 2100. So it's when it's how you say it, you know, we can give all these statistics out, but suddenly you've got to have an image to work with. We've got to have a picture in our heads which tells us what that actually means. The best case scenario, if we actually start doing something about it, isn't too bad. So we're going to go up two degrees on average. Still a lot, and we'll still really feel it, but we'll do it. So we've got the difference between two and five, but we've got to, this is the best case scenario, if we all stick to curbing greenhouse gases at below the recommended level. And of course, everybody knows that absolutely nobody's on that trajectory. And did you hear Matt Hancock today say we've all got to keep flying? Yes. Mm -hmm. So we're really, really not on that trajectory. We're really not. Uh, because still, we're in the mindset <coughs> that the economy is more important than anything else. That if, the money, if money is pouring into the country, that's what we measure as success. And that's something that's got to change because we're not defined by how much money we make. But at the moment, that is a definition of success. So you can see why Greta Thunberg um, gets very upset and very angry and starts shouting about it. And why she has been so successful is that she's managed to embody in the, in, in the actual physical body of a young and, and very... Um, straightforward young girl, she uses language which is very fresh and very direct. She doesn't wrap it up in terminology. She doesn't wrap it up in political speak or flowery language. She just says it as it is. And she tells it straight and she tells it plain. And I think that's what's beginning to happen in the stories that are being told. We're starting to tell them in a much more straightforward way because we're realizing that time is actually getting very, very tight before might even be too late to stop the rise above two degrees. So the causes of climate change. Number big one, the population of the Earth. Now it's not numbers as such, it's numbers combined with consumption. So if all those people on Earth, if 10 billion of us all lived like the sort of shakers or um, really simple sort of rural <coughs> and frugal lifestyles, this wouldn't be an issue at all. But as we know, we've got the deadly combination of a very massive increase in population with the standard of living, and by that we measure that as by how many, how much we consume, going up together. So the develop to, to be developed is to be like America, that's the sort of standard that we go by. And so all these people on Earth all trying to have a, a lifestyle like Americans is what's pushing climate to its limits. It's really quite simple. And then it gets really complicated because the climate change, uh, sorry, the, the increase in, in population 
is in the less developed countries. So that's where the number of people are growing exponentially, that's where the development is going to happen very quickly, and that's where we're going to see rapid changes in resource use. We already use masses. So we use masses and masses and masses of resources. We're probably not going to change that much in what we use, and our population isn't going to change much. In fact, quite soon it's going to start falling. Um, but we're already doing the damage, and everybody else is catching up with us. So, you know, it's, it's the standard that we've set that is the problem that the Earth is facing. So here's just some statistics, if you like statistics. Um, by mid-2012, um, we passed the 7 billion mark, um, and the developing world accounted for 97% of that growth. Um, so that's high birth rates and younger populations. Conversely, in the West, um, we're, all, we're all getting very old, and um, our birth rate's going right down because it seems to be right across the board as you get richer, population falls. And um, by 2025, deaths will have exceeded births in most of the developed countries. So it's a complicated picture of how the, the population is changing. But just because we're getting older doesn't mean to say that's all right. We're getting older, we need young people to look after us. So actually, it's not the birth rate that's the problem, it's the fact we're all living so long is the problem. Um, and I think these are all big, complicated, difficult issues that we've got to get our heads around. So it's very easy to say, oh, well, people are having too many babies. Not really. It's just that we're all living way beyond what we used to, the length of time we used to. And all of us want a decent standard of living. Of course we do. And all of us have the right to a decent standard of living. So these are really complex, ethical, difficult questions that get tossed around and they get distorted and they get taken out of context, but we have to face up to the fact that these, this is what is happening on the planet. Do you want to read that, or do you want a minute to read it? While virtually all future population growth will be in developing countries, the poorest of these countries will see the greatest percentage increase. As defined by the United Nations, these 48 countries have especially low incomes, high economic vulnerability, and poor human development indicators such as low life expectancy at birth, very low per capita income, and low levels of education. Of these countries, 33 are in sub-Saharan Africa, such as Burundi, Ethiopia, and Mozambique, and Zambia, 14 in Asia, including Bangladesh, Cambodia, Nepal, and Yemen, and one in the Caribbean, which is Haiti, which we all are very aware of. And they're growing at about 2.4% per year, and there'll be about 2 billion um, increased by 2050. <coughs> So, in other words, by 2050, Africa's population will double and Asia's will increase by a billion. So, that's succinctly put, that is where population is going to grow, that's where resources are going to go to, and already we can see China buying up large parts of Africa to exploit those resources and, um, and sell them to, the, to where people will be needing them most. We'll all then move into great big cities because that's where the distribution is easier in cities. These mega cities are growing at a great rate. Um, and mega cities need feeding. They need resources being poured into them from the rest of the world. And so everything's starting to be sucked in to certain big hotspots around the world, uh, creating very complicated chains of supply. But you can see as these cities develop and grow how much land they'll take, um, and how much energy that they'll use. And all of us need feeding. So the biggest driver of climate change, the biggest emitter of the greenhouse gases is the agricultural sector. And the harsh truth is that uh, the Western diet of, upon which most people will base their, their sort of development model is um, a diet that is high in meat and dairy. And meat and dairy requires huge amounts of water and huge amounts of land to feed the animals. And those animals emit huge amounts of, of methane. And alongside all those huge amounts of animal numbers come lots and lots of, of suffering of animals. So hand in hand with a high meat consumption comes um, suffering on behalf of the individual animals themselves. So it's a pretty toxic mix, really. 
And a lot of land then is, is taken over to growing the food that feeds those animals, which feeds us. So we're kind of going in a quite a straight route to get there. And once you have mass-produced agriculture, then you have to have very intensive systems to produce it. So, just think about it, in this country, we have lost 98% of our wildflower meadows to be turned into ryegrass, to turn into silage, which feeds the cows that we eat and whose milk we drink. And ryegrass is a monoculture of fast-growing grass. Wildflower meadows are a riot of different plant life um, and insect-rich. You'd be very hard pushed to find anything living in a ryegrass field. You'd find a lot of things living in a meadow. <coughs> Meadows cannot provide the amount of food that we need to feed the population. So we're beginning to build up an immensely complicated picture of why climate change is actually happening. <coughs> and we have this image in our heads that it's all just factories pumping out gases. It's these factories pumping out gases. And these factories are pumping out gases because we want the sort of lifestyles that we lead. So it comes right back to us. And that's where the stories are. It comes back to us. It's not some nameless mass out there. It's not some big baddie, you know, some James Bond baddie in the tower trying to destroy the world. It's all of us and the way we live our lives and the way other people will live their lives over the next 50 to 100 years because that's the model of development that we've accepted. So what I'm not trying to say is, aren't we all evil? What I'm trying to say is, everybody's trapped in a system which is accelerating ever more towards more harm to the planet. So it's a system that we have, that's developed and grown and people have got very rich on it and more people are getting rich on it. And so it's a sort of self-sustaining thing. Nobody <coughs> wants to be the first to say, well, I'll opt out of having this system. Nobody wants to do that. And so it will continue. And I do wonder what will make us change. Australia didn't really change the Australian Prime Minister, did it? The wildfires in Australia. So it didn't leave, that didn't work, if you like. Um, they'll just go back to exploiting that very large coal field almost immediately. And that coal field will be exploited and that coal will be burned. So I wonder what size of disaster it will take for us to realize how serious this is. I wonder what size of story we need to tell to get people to eat less meat and milk. But when it comes to when you go to the supermarket, somehow all that is, well, that's cheap, so I'll buy it, or, you know, I do it. I'm not saying, God, I do it. You, you go in there and you think, well, actually, my husband really likes that, so I'll buy that. And you know you shouldn't be buying it, but we do, because at the moment we still can, but there think will come a time when we can't. So I'm not actually trying to sound like I'm some great paragon of virtue, as my friends here will tell me. Over and above it all, over and above flying in the skies above all our fields of disaster, are the birds of the air and the beasts, the wild beasts that live around the edges. And those are the ones that we seem to forget about. Those are the ones that, when we talk about climate, when we talk about the environment, most people at the moment will think of climate change. Not that many people think biodiversity. Not a very nice word, nature. Somebody said to once, you know, conservationists should never use a word that hasn't been used in a poem. And I really like that. And I can't think of a poem that's got biodiversity in it. <laughs> But my friend actually said that once, and somebody at the end of the talk came up and gave them one that had just written. <laughs> so, <laughs> there's always one, isn't there? There's always one. So these great geese, great geese, I think those are, that fly over the planet, and they do the huge great migrations, and they go from the Arctic, and they come and land in a field down in Sussex, and they've flown over all this that's been going on. And they expect the world to be as it is. They want the world to just provide them with the food and the places they need to provide for their young and the next generation. They're not concerned with the human world only until we mess it all up. 
And so we forget that this great pendulum is swinging of migration of birds, let's take birds, right round the Earth, the Arctic turn from the Arctic to the Antarctic, every single year. Wow, a tiny little bird you could just hold and hardly <coughs> notice it in your hand flies from the Arctic to the Antarctic and back every single year. And what does it fly over? And can it sustain itself on that journey if all its fishing places have been degraded, fished out, and polluted? So the collateral damage from the way that we live on the Earth spills out and affects the natural world. And here's one lovely example. Who wouldn't fall in love with that? Who wouldn't? That is that big, that bird. Anybody know what it is? Something. Something. Yes. Something. The, um, I don't know. Am I going to do something wrong? Right, present. Look at its bill. It's called a spoon-billed sandpiper. So it is a sandpiper, but it's a spoon-billed sandpiper, and it's the only little spoon that's and it hatches with a bill like that. Oh, how cute is that? And this little cherub here uh, flies. Um, oh, look, there it is. He's got a picture of it. Go on, let's have a mass. <laughs> let's have a mass and love him for the spoon bill sandpiper. There it is. How tiny is that? And it has an amazing migration. Does the migration. Beak grow over time? Yeah, it gets bigger. So the beak but it's grows commensurate with the. It does. Form. Wow. But it doesn't. But it's born with its wow. food, which is just so cute. So there it is, it breeds up in Russia and then it um, goes down to Asia to um, right down through the uh, coast of China and the East Asian flyway as it's called and goes to its winter and gowns. And the poor old thing has to fly down some of the most rapidly developing and developed places on Earth. And so this big East Asian flyway has become transformed into uh, ports and agricultural areas and industrial areas. Also, it has become, because those places have been changed so much, the local people um, can't do the sort of subsistence living that they did before because all the wildlife has gone that they used to rely on and had a very sort of imbalanced relationship with the natural world. Um, so they, very often, the poorer people in these areas, very often have to rely on the migrating birds now for food, and that's what happens to the spoonbill sandpiper. It is beyond tragic. And spoonbill sandpipers went down to 20 pairs. 20 pairs. Um, WWT here in Simbridge um, rallied to the cause, did amazing things. They went out and they collected the few remains, such a high-risk strategy, Correct, uh, collected the eggs out on, on the tundra, found them, not an easy task in itself, and flew them back to Britain and raised them in Gloucestershire. Mm -hmm. you know, chicks hatched the, the eggs out, raised the chicks in Gloucestershire, then flew them back out <laughs> and released them back out. Um, and now the Spoonbill Sandpipers population has turned around in conjunction with working with the local people to bring this to an end and find alternative ways for them to get food. But that's the collateral damage. Those are the stories. And when you suddenly think, I can see now why this is really important. Because those birds are dying quite a long steps, many uh, steps in the chain down from the main cause, which is development of our land to feed a growing population and make us all much richer. And down there, right down the story chain, a beautiful and exotic birds like the spoonbill sandpiper are disappearing from the face of the earth. And the amount of effort we have to put in to stop that happening is not sustainable. We can't do that. We can't go out and get the eggs of every single bird that's endangered and bring them back to Gloucestershire, raise them and take them back again. We just can't do it. So the spoonie, as they're called, um, was very lucky that we cared enough to help. Um, and I was lucky enough to go behind the scenes at Slimbridge the other day and you just can't believe how beautiful spoonbill sandpiper chicks are running around. And the person has to sit with them uh, to make sure because they're very, they're so whizzy, the little ones. <laughs> they have a little clockwork, they go zoom, zoom like that. And they run over their little water box and tip them all over. And, and so somebody has to sit there very still and can't move. And if they would knock over water, she very carefully goes, fills it up again like that. <laughs> it's very funny to watch. Um, but it, it is a way of getting intimate 
with exoticness mm -hmm. and the problems of a big changing planet. So, this is also collateral damage. Uh, the great big fields that we need to grow the meat and the dairy, particularly the meat in this case, uh, to go into our beef burgers and our pies and things, means that the collateral damage is the forests in many parts of the world, but particularly South America, this is here. And these edge effects, they're called the edge effects. So the edge of the forest is a very, is so defined that um, a lot of animals get very stressed by suddenly the forest coming to an end. They won't cross big areas of open land. Um, so there's no sort of fragmented habitat with little corridors to allow them to sort of move. It just stops. So a lot of the birds, even though we're not eating them and we're not killing them per se, they're dying because they can't live the lives that they would like to lead because we have great big gaps in the trees. So deforestation takes the, uh, the trees that have stored a lot of carbon, those trees are burned, releasing that carbon to increase the amount of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. And alongside of that is the loss of massive amounts of wildlife. And the other collateral damage, which we all know a lot more about now, um, is the plastics. I mean, people have known about plastic pollution for um, decades. But Blue Planet 2 turned that one around quite quickly, didn't it? With the, with the whale playing with the bucket um, and the little seahorse swimming around holding a cotton bud in its tail. Um, and that is not an uncommon sight. So people have been to the coast, have they, and seen some? You know, I went to the Isle of May to film seals and I, I could barely walk along the beach on the Isle of May because of plastic rubbish. And there is a, the very famous photograph which is that. And that's a Laysan albatross. The Laysan albatross lives in an, an island in the Pacific, breeds on an island in the Pacific. It lives uh, over the oceans, but it breeds on an island in the Pacific where there are very, very few people live, but it dies with its stomach full of plastic uh, because of the way the oceans create these great big floating islands of plastic. And to an albatross, an old... A uh, cigarette lighter doesn't look that different to a silver fish bobbing at the surface of the ocean. And then they go back and they feed that to their chicks as well. So, more collateral damage. And anyway, should we be using this incredibly precious resource, which is oil, to make into plastic things which we then throw in the sea? Shouldn't we be using that oil for really useful energy? Um, and only use it for energy, and really carefully use it for energy, but not put it into things we just then chuck in the ocean. And nobody goes out and throws it in the ocean. It gets into the ocean because we're not that careful with how we throw things away. So things go into the gutter, and they get washed down, and they go into rivers, and then they go into the sea, and nobody thinks it's going to end up in an albatross. Nobody who litters here in Broadmead thinks it's going to kill an albatross in the Pacific. But the, the interconnectedness of life now um, has become so much more obvious when we see pictures like that. So that could that albatross that could have died uh, because it was eating bottle tops that came from North America or Europe. So all of us, every single one of us, is implicated in the death of an albatross, and it's kind of a big thing to get your head around, isn't it? And that's, I think, why the stories are, again, important. Because it's not intuitive. None of this is intuitive. It's not like stories like, I'm going to get a gun, and I'm going to walk up, and I'm going to shoot that dodo, and it falls down dead. And I know that chain. Me, gun, kill dodo, dead, extinction. That's a simple story. Me drinking a bottle of water, not being very careful about how I throw it away, floats in the ocean, ends up in an albatross, and an albatross is dead on a Pacific island where nobody lives, is not an intuitive story. It's a really complicated story. And even more so when you say, driving to the supermarket is killing polar bears. That's even more of a difficult one, because driving to the supermarket increases greenhouse gases, which is melting the oceans, melting the ice, and making it very difficult for polar bears to feed. 
So you see how the stories that we're telling are getting more and more complicated, more and more difficult, and that's why we need to find ways of telling them that make people say, I get it now. I really understand that. I didn't understand it before, but I get it now. Much closer to home, chucking away um, these drinks cartons, which have the holes in the top. The hedgehog doesn't know. You can't get its head back out again. So many, many hedgehogs used to die from McDonald's. Had it's called a McFlurry or something. I don't know. I've never had one. But come on, own up. Who's had a McFlurry? See, <laughs> <laughs> I don't even know what it is. But lots of people did, and they were the cause of huge numbers of hedgehogs deaths. Actually, but I think they've changed the design now. But we've got a long way to go, haven't we? We've got a long way to go to make school kids realise, school kids around me, where I live up in Kingsdown, I can't tell you how much of this has dropped around. So we're still not getting the message through. And I don't think it's malicious, it's just thoughtlessness. It's just lack of connection. It's lack of emotional connection with the planet that we live on. It's a lack of understanding that we're global citizens and we live in a local area. And our lo what we do locally <coughs> affects the planet globally. And the other collateral damage. Now, is that fishing? Does that look like fair fishing to you? <laughs> is, that, is that a fair contest between man and fish? I don't think so, really. And when you think that much of that fish will either be chucked back into the sea dead because it's the wrong size and they're not allowed to land it if it's the wrong size, or it's the wrong sort, so it will go to feed cats and dogs. But that's one boat catching that amount of fish. It's not surprising that 70% of the fish stocks around the world are stressed to less than sustainable levels. So that's another collateral damage. We don't need to use this amount of fish. Nobody can justify that amount of fish. And then sell it so cheaply. And all the metals and minerals that we use in our computers and mobile phones and all the clever technologies um, come out of big holes in the ground. And they are, really are big holes in the ground. I mean, it's hard to get your head around the scale of that, but these trucks here are on those roads there. And you can see how big those trucks are compared to the people. So we're kind of eating it all the way. It's really, it's a really cheerful talk, this, isn't it? <laughs> Is everybody feeling quite, quite desperate at the moment? It will get better. So, but not at the moment. So 4.2 million people die a year, each year from air pollution, and 91% of us live in some form of polluted air. So it's just unrelenting awfulness, isn't it? It's unrelenting. I'm not going to go on any more about it. I'm going to stop it. Well, the last slide. Wildlife populations have now plummeted by 60% since the 1970s. Now, I'm old enough to remember the 1970s. Not many people in this room are, I can tell. But <laughs> <laughs> they know how to charm. Um, but come on, let's, us oldies, for the benefit of all the young people here, it didn't used to be this bad, did it? Who remembers the old thing now, scraping the insects off the windscreen of the car because you literally yes. couldn't yeah. see? Yeah. Do you do that now? Yeah. No. Do, so there's not enough insects around, they're not splattering in our cars anymore. I used to remember, we all used to remember, I hate this when I was younger and people did this, but I'm going to do it. Having to shut the window to stop the moths coming in to fly around the window. Mm -hmm. Doesn't happen much now, does it? If you live with a mother, it does. Well, if you live with a mother, maybe. <laughs> he probably brings them in. Um, I remember uh, my dad was a great gardener and he had a, a bushes that were covered in butterflies. I remember being transfixed by the number of butterflies. And he and I used to listen out for the first cuckoo of the spring. There was always a letter in the Times. We don't get any of that now because it doesn't happen anymore. So it's not as though we've lost, it's all gone extinct. It's just thinned out so much. There's so much less of it. There's a lot less wildlife on Earth than there used to be. So 6% less Bees buzz and birds sing and little animals scuttle and big animals roar. You know, there's just a lot less of life on Earth. 
And that's a great tragedy. It's a great tragedy for those animals, and it's a great tragedy for us and our imaginations and our curiosity and our inspiration as well. Because the natural world has provided us with so much joy and wonder and inspiration. And we're just losing it very dramatically. And so what do we do? And I think one of the most famous, we're now in a Wesley Chapel, a great, a great lover of the Bible, John Wesley. And he said, ask the, uh, he didn't, Joe said in the Bible, ask the animals and they will teach you about things. Or the birds in the sky and they'll tell you, or speak to the earth and it will teach you, or let the fish of the sea inform you. Has there ever been a truer sentence than that? If we look at the natural world, it is telling us so much about what we're doing. And so we can't just look at that graph that I showed right at the start and think, be disassociated from it to make it live. For me, I have to look at the natural world and it tells me what's going on. And that's why I've dedicated so much time and so much to try to get those stories out there. The animal that I'm doing so much for, hopefully, is the curlew, as we mentioned. Let me give you, I don't know if you're familiar with the curlew, but it's a very long legged wading bird that was very common, has a beautiful trilling call. Very, very common in Ireland and Wales and the uplands. Except in Wales, we think we've got 10 breeding seasons left before it's extinct in Wales as a breeding bird. Look at the birds, the birds of the sky, and they will tell you. And we think we know it all, but God had an answer to Job, didn't he, when Job was saying, but, you know, it's all, so, it's all your fault. Where were you when I laid the foundations of the earth? Tell me if you know so much. Do you know how its dimensions were determined and who did the surveying? What supports its foundations and who laid its cornerstone as the morning stars sang together and all the angels shouted for joy? Who defined the boundaries of the sea as it burst from the womb and as I clothed it with clouds and thick darkness? We don't know really. And the more that we're looking, the less we realize, with the less we know. And, and it's very humbling that it's taken us to get to this point to realize that we didn't know so much and that it unravels very quickly because we didn't realize how much we depended on it, how much that bird depended on that wetland, how much those fish depended on having nursery grounds that we haven't turned into shrimp farms. You know, we've learned so much in this process of industrialization and development We've learned and learned and learned that the world is much more complicated and interconnected than we ever knew, thought before and that we're part of that interconnection and that we need to look after the world if we're not going to fall by the wayside like these creatures as well. And the person who got it big time was St Francis of Assisi. St Francis of Assisi, no one has caught up even yet with St Francis of Assisi when he called the natural world, his brothers and sisters. Brother, uh, brother, son and sister moon. You know, he called fish his brother and cicadas his sisters. And he talked to the birds as though they were part of his world. You know, we haven't even got close to that recognition of interconnectedness which St. Francis had way back in the 14th, 15th century, 14th century. Better be careful, people who know that here. 14th century. 13th century, thank you. <laughs> um, so what do we do? Pope Francis, I ask you to be revolutionaries. I ask you to swim against the tide. Yes, I'm asking you to rebel against this culture that sees everything as temporary. Have the courage to swim against the tide. Pope Francis, to a youth gathering in South America. And I think that's a very good statement to have the courage to swim against the tide, to go against the paradigm, to stand up to people like Donald Trump and say it isn't all about money, you know? It's not all about money. But you would be forgiven for thinking it was if you looked at some of the big leaders that we've put in place around the world today. I'm gonna leave it there. I'm gonna leave you with that and actually go back to that. Because I think that's probably a, 
where we can start the discussion if you'd like to have any more discussion. But how can we be revolutionaries in a world that doesn't like revolutionaries very much? Um, and how can you be a revolutionary, an effective revolutionary? Do you have to do it in the way of Extinction Rebellion or are there other ways of being a revolutionary which we, where we can change the stories that we're telling about the planet? Thank you very much.